So I want to welcome um, the group called Stop Private Jet Expansion. And um, in just a minute, I'm going to turn it over to Alex, who is going to say more. But first, I just wanted to thank our own Annie Calhoun for uh, uh, keeping, continuing to, to pester me about this issue and keeping the bee in my bonnet. And like I said in the service, you know, for a church that talks about cherishing the living earth, I think this topic is uh, particularly interesting for us to consider. And so without further ado, I will turn things over now to Alex Chatfield, who comes to us um, from St. Anne's and from the Climate Justice Ministry there. So let's give a warm welcome to Alex. Thank you for welcoming us. Uh, it's nice to look out and see so many neighbors and friends. Um, just to set a baseline for us, uh, I think it's always helpful in any presentation about uh, climate change to go right back to the basics, just so we're using the same terminology and understanding the challenge together. So this is our Climate Change 101 slide. Uh, we know that the burning of fossil fuels releases carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. However, we have built many, many systems that uh, sustain our society and economy um, on uh, systems that rely on burning those fossil fuels. It's one of the reasons it's been so hard to change. Those systems require vast quantities of fuel, and so uh, as a species, we've been releasing uh, vast quantities of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, especially uh, over the last uh, 60 to 80 years. In the atmosphere, that acts like a heat-trapping blanket, and uh, we have known the science of the greenhouse effect since the 1800s. This is nothing new, and it's definitely not controversial. So the heat uh, has many consequences, and one that affects New England is that it has been warming our oceans, which in turn leads to more powerful hurricanes, and those cause immense damage to homes and businesses and habitats. I could mention other disasters like the floods in Lemonster and Andover last summer, the fact that uh, our farmers' crops were wiped out by the truly catastrophic rain that we had early in the summer. Um, it was easily over $100 million last year for Massachusetts alone. So this is the problem, which is that Concentrations of CO2 have been rising dramatically uh, in the atmosphere. They are now the highest, highest in the history of recorded civilization. We don't really know uh, what all the effects are going to be because at some point we reach these tipping points where the melting of the tundra releases an accelerated amount of CO2 and the disappearance of the ice caps means that the Earth is not as reflective, so that causes more heating. The green line is shown at 350 parts per million. We blew through that a number of years ago. We're now hovering over 400 parts per million in the atmosphere. Um, approximately when we blew through that green line was when Jim Hansen testified before the Congress and said that NASA had detected the warming of the Earth, that it was very serious, that something needed to be done about it. Um, and we have essentially squandered 35 years since then not doing very much about it. So 2023, uh, I literally think that every single week I picked up one of the newspapers and read a story about climate change that was pretty shocking. And that was an accurate record because every other week, on average, the United States suffered a climate-related disaster that cost $1 billion or more. And that is a new record that is, you know, way above the average for the past 20 years. Um, the cost of these is borne by everybody. Uh, homeowners, businesses, insurance companies, especially government, 
I think the flooding in Vermont cost close to a billion dollars, and about 600 million of that will end up being a federal responsibility in, in one way or another. So the fact is, all of us are paying for this, um, regardless of where we live. Um, and uh, the bottom line is there is literally no safe additional amount of carbon that we can put into the atmosphere. If we think there is, we're just fooling ourselves. Fortunately, Massachusetts is one of the states that has begun to take this very seriously. Uh, back in 2021, after about a 13-year drought in passing any major climate legislation, we did pass some very bold legislation, very comprehensive. It has a net zero requirement for the state by 2050, and every sector will have declining emissions requirements. And already you see the effect of the law in so far as all of our communities, all of our neighboring communities are very actively working on climate plans and other initiatives like community choice aggregation and encouraging the development of EVs and building electrification. Everybody's hard at work. We know it's gonna be a long-term challenge and very expensive. But it's worth it because the costs of inaction are far, far higher. So now let's talk about what's happening at Hanscom. I'll let you out of there, Alex. Uh, thank you very much for having us. Uh, my name's Neil Rasmussen. I'm a Lincoln Sudbury class of 1972 graduate. I had a long career in energy, and uh, now I'm retired. I serve on the board of MIT, where I'm on special committees regarding climate and energy. So as Alex said, we all should be thinking about what we can do. And I'm sure we all try and do that when we think about how we're going to vote or what kind of car we're going to buy and so on. And those can make a difference, and that's great that we're making those differences. But every now and then, we have a chance to make a really big difference. And that's what this project is about, a project that's in our own towns. And we have an opportunity to make a huge difference that's actually much greater than anything you could ever do in Lincoln. Even if you eliminated all the carbon dioxide from Lincoln, it wouldn't be as big as what this project represents. So what, what am I talking about? The, the, we're talking about the private luxury jet hangar expansion at Hanscom Field. Um, and it's subsidized by the federal and state governments. And so it's really crazy in these regards. So this project, it, just to put it in scale, because people can't quite understand what it is, the project is about is located at the north side of the airfield, on the, in the bed in the Bedford area, and it is two thirds of a mile in length. And as I show, here's the size of a typical house in relation to this, just to show the scale of it. It's absolutely enormous. It's 475,000 square feet of hangar space, which can hold up to like 80 or 90 jets, depending on the size of the jets. Now, you may have heard, I don't know if you've heard about this project before, but recently they announced, oh, don't worry, we're going to reduce the number of hangars. But they actually made the hangars bigger and made, them, and made less, so they actually will hold even more jets than they originally proposed. So what's it going to do? It's going to expand the infrastructure for jets by over a factor of two at the airport. It represents the single largest development in the history of that airport. It represents the largest known project for generating greenhouse gases in Massachusetts. No project even comes close to the, generating this amount. And it relieves the current jet capacity constraints at the airport, which you might argue are a good thing to have jet constraints on this capacity. And it definitely is designed, and everybody has said multiple times, the proponents, Massport, it supports the planned growth of the private luxury jet industry. And it's the li largest such project known in America, maybe even the world. So uh, Alex mentioned that the state has this goal that we're going to cut the emissions in every category uh, by 2050. And it's with a net zero goal, actually, and everybody has to have a plan for doing that. And lo and behold, our towns have plans for doing that. And here's our plans. Um, so you can see the Lexington emits more 
than the other four, the other three towns, and it has a plan to go to where it's. Here's where it starts according to their own greenhouse gas inventory, and here's where it's going to go by 2050. These are great plans, and they fully support the um, state law. But here is the same graph, but I changed the vertical axis. Here's the four town plans down here, and they're going towards zero. Here's where Hanscom is right now with private jets. And here's where it's planned to go, depending on what you assume for growth. And the industry announces every day that their planned growth is 10% a year, which really takes it up by 2050. But and it, it, the minimum, 2% is commercial growth, air traffic growth, and everybody agrees it's going to be more than that. So it's somewhere between this, and if you assume it's five, it goes up like this, well, it's going up while the towns are going down towards zero. And here's the crazy thing. Boston also has a plan. Boston's plan started way off the top of the chart, and by 2040, it passes Hanscom. It's going down while Hanscom is going up, and Hanscom will emit more than the entire city of Boston. And here's a, a plot of what kind of uh, capacity that they're planning versus time. And you can see it's got like kind of a radical looking shape there. And uh, there's some other parts to this step here that have already been in development this last year. Whoops. So how do we know what comes out of these aircraft? What's going on? You can, the math isn't that complicated to do. You can multiply it out. There's, we know that there's 38,400 jet, private jet operations per year at the airport. They have a two or two and a half hour estimated flight time, uh, and, it's, and they burn about 330 gallons per hour on the average. Some burn 250, some burn 600. And you can, basic chemistry tells you how many, how many uh, kilograms of CO2 come out per gallon of jet fuel. It just, it's chemistry. And there's actually the greenhouse gas effects of private jets are not only carbon. Alex talked about carbon, but that's not greenhouse gases. Other things contribute to greenhouse gases, and so what you, can, what you need to do is apply a multiplier to the carbon to get the greenhouse gas equivalent of all the mix of what comes out of private jets. And that factor, according to the IPCC, is about two. So you multiply this number, that's another multiplier that goes in. So you multiply all this together and we get out that it's like 610 to 753 tons of CO2e greenhouse gases per year. And here's, the, you know, just for reference, a typical car is about five tons per year. Now, uh, are these things, okay, we're taking, we're really taking a lot of greenhouse gases here. What's the benefit? What do we get out of it? Well, there's certainly some things that you can't do without a private jet, right? You can't fly contraband or drugs or guns without a private jet. I understand that. Um, <laughs> And, and so, but, and, and you can't just fly wherever you want, whenever you want to in a private jet, without a private jet. And so, but let's just look at the cost versus the benefit here. The jet emissions today cancel out nearly 50% of the benefit of all the solar ever installed in Massachusetts. That's incredible when you think about it. I mean, we're a leader. A lot of states aren't as good as we are in installing solar. Yet all of that gain that we've, from all the last 20 or 25 years putting that in, is negated by just the private jets at Hanscom. And they're not the only private jets in Massachusetts. So uh, the, and as you can see from the prior graphs, the expected growth from Hanscom, just the growth, not even the baseline, but the growth projected, swamps all of the total uh, greenhouse gas contributions of the surrounding towns, many surrounding towns. And what does it do? It services a few people. You can't just go in there and do whatever you want at that airport. You've got to have your, you know, you've got to have your jet or your contract for a jet and so on. And it services primarily resort destinations. And there's a lot of work been done on this recently. You see it covered in the, it's been covered in the globe you know, with multiple articles over the last year that as they track where these planes are going, they found out like the steward hospital guy who has these private jets, he's flying, you think he's flying for, for patients or something on those private jets? No, he's flying to the Mediterranean 
to St. Tropez and all these other places, right? And here's the crazy thing. When you put this in perspective, the emissions from one private jet round trip to, uh, to uh, Asia are equivalent to the emissions of an entire rural family in India over their entire lifetime. So we don't have any excuse of how we can tell the rest of the world they need to improve their carbon emissions. When we're doing things like this, a frivolous uh, flight from w for one person even to India wipes out their entire contribution of a family for a lifetime. So are they necessary for the economy? You can look it up in the magazines, like Boston Magazine, here's an ad. Oh, here's where you want to go in your private jet, Martha's Vineyard, Nantucket. How does that make any sense? For one thing, we know that short hop private jets are the worst possible form of travel because most of their emissions are just during takeoff. So by the time you get up, you have to come down if you're going to Nantucket. So it's really bad. And this is, again, uh, this is how they advertise them. And according to the Wall Street Journal, this is the kind of things that they're used for. Here's another thing I recently saw, this, uh, a new service, canine jets. They'll fly your dog on a private jet. You wouldn't want them to have to fly coach. So not only is the societal benefit low, but we're subsidizing this craziness. It's insane, the subsidies. There's no sales tax on private jets. You buy a Toyota, you get taxed, right? You go to New Hampshire and buy a Toyota, they find you and make you pay a tax in Massachusetts. You buy a private jet, no, it's exempt. It's right in the law. You buy that private jet, and it's not enough to just buy it. You have to fit it out with a zebra wood interior and all the other leather and all that other stuff, right? That's another five or eight million dollars. That's also exempt from sales tax. Furthermore, there's, all, there's no property tax on the facilities, the private jet facilities. They're exempt from sales tax. There, the tax laws provide major write-offs and tax breaks to incent jet ownerships. The, cons the uh, financial firms write whole books for, of how to use your private jet to avoid taxes. And it's incredible. You can almost get away with having a private jet for free if you're a wealthy person. There's so many write-offs that you can build in when you own a private jet. And the state and local jet fuel taxes are prohibited under federal law, so we can't even pass a law in Massachusetts saying, oh, we want to tax those private jets, their fuel, for, for their destruction to the climate. Nope, preempted by federal law. And private jet runway and towers, who pays for them? The federal government pays for them, but where do they get the money? They get it from the commercial flyers. The commercial flyers, you have a ticket, a, a, a tax on your commercial flight that is pulled out and used to build all this equipment, the runways, the towers, the staff, all that's paid for by you on your commercial ticket. And furthermore, they even have this uh, proposed reauthorization bill, which didn't make it through last year, but is still hovering around, where they're going to ask uh, the f federal dollars to subsidize and not only that, build private jet hangars. And then it, the craziest thing of all that we just heard was in Bedford, they, the proponent applied for and obtained a historic uh, Tax, not, not, it's, a, it's a direct contribution to them. It's not just a tax avoidance. They got a grant, and they're, they're trying to get a grant for $5 million and have always been approved for a, a, like half of that, just for, uh, because they claim they're restoring an ancient hangar that has fallen down. But it's not, for, and it, so it's a historic, it's one of those historic things that the state tries to help people with, like you have a historic building, like a church or something that needs help. They're going to restore an ancient hangar that nobody has access to. And all that it's for is for a few people to fly their luxury jets. They've, and I don't know if you've heard about the project before, but they've made a bunch of arguments that have sort of unraveled over time. One is they said it's a net zero project. And they've published and publicized that many times. And what they mean is the things on the ground uh, are net zero. The buildings, are they're trying to make the buildings net zero. But, and if they did that with all of the things they plan to build in, like electric car chargers and solar panels and so on, they're claiming they're going to reduce 700 tons of building emissions by doing that to make it net zero. But they ignore what the aircraft put out. They don't even count that. They said, oh, 
We, it's not our fault that the aircraft are using it. <laughs> We're just building it for them. We're only responsible for the buildings, not all what the aircraft do. The project will not generate any new flights, they've claimed. But here's the funny part. They already told us at the last meeting that they're expecting 15,000 gallons a day to flow into this place, be delivered in trucks, 15,000 gallons a day, okay? That's not going in the buildings. That's jet fuel. That's going in jets. And the, but how do they explain, oh, we're not going to generate any new flights, but uh, we're going to be pumping in 15,000 gallons of jet fuel that are going to be used by the jets. It doesn't add up. And then they also have said it'll re their project will theoretically reduce an unknown number of ferry flights, which is a very vague statement. Yet, under repeated questioning, they've been unable to provide an, a, and identify a single example of an aircraft that exhibits these flights that would be reduced by this project. And they've not been able to identify a single place where such aircraft are currently stored and would relocate to Hanscom. So it's, it's really outrageous, and uh, developers like this should not be making such misleading claims. Can you ask what various lines are? Yeah, so the, here it's, it's complicated, but the, um, the idea that they proposed is, oh, one of the benefits of this is there's other planes that can't find a home at Hanscom. So they find a home at, let's say, Nashua. And they really want to be here. So there's somebody here who wants to get picked up. So the plane flies in from Nashua, picks them up, goes to the Bahamas, comes back from the Bahamas, drops them off, and flies back to Nashua to its home. But it can't find a home at Hanscom. So that's what it has to do. That's what they've said. And therefore, they argue, once we give them a home, we'll build this housing. You know, it's, it's so sad that they don't, can't find any housing, these poor people, right? But it, they build them a home. And then supposedly they would park their plane there and just fly out of Hanscom to the Bahamas and fly back. And therefore you'd eliminate those two little flights from Nashua to Hanscom, right? That makes, it's logically con complete, that statement. But so the question is, and they have all the data. They know every flight that flies in and out of there and where it goes. They can just look it up and tell me how many planes are doing that right now and what airport are they currently using? They've been unable to provide a single example of one aircraft doing that or a single example of one place like Nashua where they're coming from. And so that's, that's really a, it's totally misleading. They've, they said it was, oh, it's, it's, it's a hypothetical argument and it'll be a benefit, but then they were unable to quantify it. Does that help? So uh, the other thing that people have said over and over again is, oh, don't worry the low carbon aviation is coming. We're gonna make aviation that won't have any greenhouse gases. And that's, that'd be great. You know, if it didn't, we wouldn't be here complaining about it. But the problem is, it's not even true, all right? One argument is, oh, there'll be electric aircraft coming. But even the, uh, the, Massa the federal US aviation climate plan says such aircraft will never replace jets. And the known technologies of batteries weigh 50 times more per mile than jet fuel, the batteries. That's the known technology, 50 times more. So they'd have to do, make batteries 50 times lighter in order to uh, make them substitute for, for jet fuel. And everybody knows that's not going to happen. It only would be useful for very short flights, like maybe to Nantucket or something but it's really not going to replace jets. And so even the, even the most optimistic plans of the industry don't project it happening. So it's been a bit of a smokescreen. The other thing is called sustainable aviation fuels, which is sort of like this holy grail of, oh, we'll give you this fuel and you burn it, and it won't even make greenhouse gases. That's not true either, because these, sta these fuels still emit the same amount or even more greenhouse gases than jet fuel when you burn them. That's just the way chemistry works. The problem is, what they claim though is they will absorb, they'll be based on some sort of crops that will absorb CO2 while they're growing. And therefore, you won't, it won't be as bad as, emit, as burning jet fuel. Yet, it turns out, and I talked to some guys at MIT, they said if we actually did that, any kind of crop that we know of would use all of the arable land on Earth to generate enough jet fuel 
to supply the aviation industry. All the arable land on Earth. So that's kind of impractical. And, uh, and so the idea that, so really they're, they're speculating that some future unknown technology may exist that would allow us to make this sustainable jet fuel. And they're banking on it coming. It's a magic technology of unknown proportions. It seems kind of crazy to like go forward with all this uh, emission and hope that something's magical is coming. It seems like you'd want to develop that first before you did anything like this, but that's the way it goes. So what are we why would we want to stop this project? Because first of all, it's not just here. We're, this project has a ripple effect because this is the largest private jet port in New England. And there's a waiting list of people who want to buy and fly private jets if the project goes forward. We want to slow that process down. And by having one of the, the largest private jet port in New England and putting the brakes there, it actually puts a squeeze on the entire system, which benefits us. And it'll, and it could, and it'll start slowing down current flights, uh, private jet purchases, and private jet production. And so w what we do here will have a ripple effect on the entire system, but it also is uh, creating a network of groups who are doing the same thing at other airports. So it can have a, a giant ripple effect much more than just here. Like here's, this just went on a couple of weeks ago in England. And there, there's Greta Thunberg, I don't know if you know who she is, <laughs> sitting there. Uh, and so it, this is not unique to here or this area, it's all over the world. So who can do anything about this? The towns have no regulatory authority. Massport doesn't need a permit from Bedford or anybody when they do these things because they're exempted under the law. The legislature has no regulatory authority. That doesn't even make sense to people, but the legislature cre created Massport and made it independent, and, it, and so they can't make any rulings that actually affect Massport. It's built into the Enabling Act that created it. Uh, and Massport itself has no power over how the airport is used once the facilities are built. Like, suppose they told us, oh, don't worry, the flights will go down. And then instead, oops, they went way up. Can we hold Massport accountable for that? They say, oh, we can't do anything. It's not ours, right? We're, we're preempted by federal law from doing anything about flights or discriminating against any aircraft. And so limiting the infrastructure that is built is the only control that the state has over these things. And uh, Massport, who is the controls the property and can decide what gets built, only reports to the governor because the governor appoints the members and the executive director of Massport, of which she's appointing one right now. And so she has indirect authority. She can't actually decide not to do it, but she can go in the back room and tell them, I'm appointing you guys, just cut this out. She can do that. And that's what we need to have happen. So she, it's, it's unusual that we have this situation. Appealing to Massport does nothing, because Massport's entire charter is based not around climate. They have not a single line item in there about climate. It's, and the FAA doesn't either. It's just about growth of, of aviation is the only thing that they have a mandate for. So our governor is the only option, and that's what we need to work on. And uh, our, our statement is simple. We shouldn't be dr building this kind of infrastructure anywhere because it's antithetical to Massachusetts and federal emissions plans. So I'll let Alex tell you what we can do. Thank you, Neil. I, we really appreciate the dark humor. <laughs> Everybody I meet is saying, what's going on with Hanscom? What's happening next? When are we going to find out about the draft uh, environmental uh, impact report that's coming out? So a couple of things you can do in the very short term, and then I think we're going to have uh, a handout. Is that right? To, to give out, which will give a lot more uh, details and ideas. So you're all invited tomorrow evening to come over to Middlesex Community College. It's just on the other side of the VA hospital up on Springs Road in Bedford. 
And the presentation uh, by the proponents is gonna start at six o'clock. You won't actually get to meet the developers, but you can meet all of their lawyers and paid consultants who are in charge of giving the presentation. Uh, if you want to join us in a demonstration against the project, then you can come at 5.30. Uh, we will be along the edge of the parking lot in a space that's been sanctioned by campus security, so you won't be um, violating any rules. Uh, and we're going to show uh, very visible uh, opposition to the, to the project um, from 5.30 to 6, and then we'll go inside to, to listen to the presentation. Another way that you can be updated on what's going on is to join us on Wednesday, March 6th at 7 p.m. And uh, that's going to be our webinar uh, featuring a number of experts, uh, including Professor Naomi Oreskes um, from Harvard, who uh, wrote the book um, Merchants of Doubt. Uh, and most recently, what's her new book title? Anyway, she has a new book on climate uh, that, that has just come out, and the name of it escapes me. But in any case, she's going to be introducing the webinar, and then we'll be, we'll be going over some of this material and some other material as well. We are now expecting the release of the draft environmental impact report, March 15th. Uh, to give you a perspective on how effective our coalition has been so far, this was init initially projected to come out in September. So we, through our fierce opposition uh, and putting pressure on the Healy administration, have really forced them to do a far more thorough job, uh, in, and, as well as Secretary Tepper, um, uh, in, in preparing this report. I think initially they probably imagined no one would read it. Now everyone's going to read it. Um, and when uh, the report does come out, there will be a public comment period. Um, we're guessing it's going to run for more than a month. And in the uh, one year ago, during that same two-week comment period, we got 350 uh, public comments submitted. We're going for 1,000 this time. Excellent question. Um, so <laughs> this is another example of how um, weak our ability is to regulate uh, situations like this. So under the Massachusetts Environmental Policy Act, which is MEPA for short, um, projects w which reach a cer certain threshold of scale um, are uh, required to go through this uh, reporting process. In this case, it was the 38 acres of new pavement that's going to be paved over where there's currently a forest. Um, and uh, so the size of that parking lot uh, triggered the MEPA process. Um, there, there's a lot of information in there about climate. There's a lot of information about things like stormwater runoff and uh, many other issues uh, r related to the local communities. And Secretary Tepper did a pretty amazing job in terms of the scope of questions that she submitted. And it will be interesting to see whether they will be able to live up to <clears throat> the expectations. So that will kind of land on her desk and she will review it. And she has an opportunity to tell them that they haven't done their term paper completely and that they need to go back and revise it. Um, but, but that will depend in part on how many uh, people submit um, public comments and how effectively uh, they're able to attack the, um, the data and, and the conclusions that are reached in the report. Yes. When the roadmap passed, did it put any teeth in MEPA about climate change? And if it didn't, could we work with uh, Senator Barrett to see if there could be an amendment that would put teeth in about climate change for MEPA? Do you want to take that one? Yeah, so, you know, when they wrote this, it basically says every sector of the economy of Massachusetts has to go down. 
And then it has some example kinds of things in it, but it didn't spend a lot of time about aviation in it. And, they, and I've t the legislators themselves said after it was passed, they said, you know what, we didn't do enough clarifying what it's about here. And like, for example, you know, a lot of these kinds of reports are done around the country. And, and if, if you look at flights that fly internationally, of which a lot fly to Europe out of Hanscom, right? A lot of people say that's not the responsibility of the airport. It's not the responsibility of the country. The UN is supposed to monitor those and decide what to do about them. I, this, is, this is real. Okay, so there's a huge debate over how we tackle the issues of climate related to uh, especially these kind of aircraft. But what's definitely in, I mean, I think they definitely considered, you know, little propeller planes in, but they're irrelevant in terms of the emissions compared to the private jets. So I think it's, it's incomplete. The, the uh, it's it, it's ambiguous in regard to that, but Senator Barrett says it's certainly not exempt, but we probably need some more clarification. Please, as far as the MEPA re as far as the MEPA review process, which I think you were talking about, for the first time, GHG emissions, even as they relate to aircraft emissions, are included. This is very new, and it's going to be a testing ground for us. So as we uh, uh, submit our public comments, meaning all of us here, you know, we will need to address that and make sure that there are some very firm answers from the developers regarding that piece. Does everybody remember the movie Back to the Future? Michael J. Fox, I think he ended up going back to 1955. So think about the world in 1955 and think about what the environmental movement at the time was focused on at that time. It was largely limited to land conservation. There were people who were worried about dirty air, and dirty water, and, and other things, but the environmental justice movement was limited to just a very few communities, uh, and we certainly weren't talking about global warming or greenhouse gas emissions, right? Well, a year later, the Massport Enabling Legislation was passed, and three years later, in 1958, the FAA was formed. And as Neil said a minute ago, both of those were based on the premise that growth in aviation was good. It was going to be good for the economy, it was going to be good for people who wanted to travel, it was going to be good for American industry, et cetera, et cetera. And even though Ever after that, we have seen that growth of aviation has involved the creation of sacrifice zones all around our airports with the people dealing with the noise and the pollution and the traffic and all of those other societal problems. We are still in the thrall of 70-year-old legislation. And it continues to do the same thing over and over and over again. So you can be shocked by how terrible this plan is. This is a feature of those laws. It's not a bug. This isn't happening accidentally. It just took two multimillionaire investors, Jeff Leering and Michael Argyros, to come along and see an opportunity to buy a few acres of land adjacent to the airport, after which they knew they could push this deal through because every state and federal law supports this. It doesn't put any controls on it. And that's the thing we have to remember. So I'm curious if you would be willing to provide a set of comments that people will make, because I think it's a lot to ask people to wade through an EIR. And I do think that encouraging comments, you know, if we have a template of things that are most important to include. I'm going to pass back to Katie Winchell from Save Our Heritage. Yes, so if you're interested in doing that, we encourage you to, uh, we will be providing an action alert with a toolkit for public comment submissions. And uh, the best way to stay in touch with us is to go to our website, which is stopprivatejetexpansion.org. Sign the petition to the governor and then you'll be instantly on our email list. That's the quickest, quickest way to do it. Other than that, we'll be passing these out, uh, which uh, sort of uh, remind you of the same information and how to get connected with us. Uh, yeah. I can't say enough good things about our website. 
it is encyclopedic and it is uh, snazzy and it's got lots of uh, great um, examples of articles and letters and uh, other uh, ideas about how to communicate with the Healy administration. Um, someone asked uh, just before we started, what about the governor? What is she saying? You know, what does she think? What is she going to do? Governor Healy's being very, very careful uh, in, in the comments that she's making. Um, and uh, she's absolutely well aware of our uh, coalition and what we've been doing. She's already received printed signatures from 10,000 people that we presented to her in the beginning of October. We think our petition signatures are over 13,000 now. Um, but she and her team, including Secretary Tepper of the Environment and also her climate czar, uh, Melissa Hofer, or Hoffer, um, although I think they have the best of intentions, uh, they are waiting to see what comes out in this report and we hope are waiting for the right moment to send the signal to Massport that this is intolerable. Um, but we need to provide the political cover and momentum uh, to, to them uh, so that when they take that stand, uh, it is in response to what the citizens of Massachusetts demand. And uh, not just from our communities, but all around the state. This is really a follow-up to Ginny's point, because I, I agree it's tough to wade through these things. But you know, in order for these things, for commas to be effective, they really need to be pointed and based in fact. And I'm, you know, and having somebody really waded through the details to, to give us advice. And I'm wondering how you're co going about that. My answer was too short, but about the toolkit. The toolkit will include talking points. It will include the facts. It will include the claims versus the facts. Um, and it, so it will be pretty complete. I think you'll find everything that you need in there, um, but it won't come out until the developers uh, submit their DEIR. And at the expected time is March 15th. About a week after that, MEPA will make it public and it's at that point that, you know, if you're on our email list, then we're happy to, you know, share those talking points within the toolkit for it to, with you. And um, if it's not comprehensive enough, you can always just email us. <laughs> yeah, I was curious who your consultants are. Are these you, this is just doing internally from the organization? So, oh, yeah, okay. Well, so Neil, Neil um, and... Oh, excuse me, um, has, you know, has been following these um, DEIRs for 20 years. And uh, we have other people as well that have offered their professional expertise that we'll be meeting with. So um, I think you'll find that our information is pretty scrupulous. If you're having a little sense of whiplash over all this information, even if you've been really involved in, in following issues related to climate or have uh, personally uh, you know, been engaged in um, uh, you know, the municipal work that's been done in town, passing bylaws, uh, or even coming out and protesting uh, things like uh, pipeline expansion uh, or, or other uh, issues that, that, uh, that so many groups have addressed on Beacon Hill. I mean, asking the governor not to uh, allow the uh, construction of any more fossil fuel infrastructure. I can tell you, I've been working on these issues for 10 years. And up until last February, I really didn't think about planes. I mean, I knew people individually who were saying they were flying less for the sake of climate because they realized it was a lot, and so they were going to cut back on some trips or even just take the train for a year, you know, if they were super committed. And I naively thought that someone somewhere at some level of government had made a serious plan for reducing aviation emissions. There's no plan. There's no plan at the federal level or the state level. So if we want there to be a plan, we have to start with something. We have to have a win. And I believe uh, that if this project were canceled because it is a reckless 
uh, act of, of climate destruction and the word got out that an organized group in Massachusetts was able to make that happen, it would be the first time any place in the country that that's happened. So, so this is an amazing opportunity. Um, the odds are against us though. If you haven't already noticed, this industry is so Teflon that <laughs> Uh, I mean, we've had other examples, right, of the tobacco industry, the uh, big oil influencing and, uh, you know, wielding incredible influence over politics and evading regulations for years and years and years. And that's still going on in the case of the fossil fuel industry. But these guys make them look like chumps um, based on the tax breaks and the fact that no one is regulating the growth of these facilities or the number of flights or how much fuel gets burned. So if that alarms you, please get involved with what we're doing. Tom. Yeah, Alex, do the, um, do the proponents for this, are they rolling out an environmental justice argument for their plan saying that, you know, this is going to reduce flights in East Boston or something and using that as an argument for expanding at Hanscom and saying, you know, we need to spread the load to the western suburbs and do we have a good counter argument to that that we can roll out ourselves? That's a really good question, Tom. Uh, in September, I was, a board, I was appointed by the town to the Massport Community Advisory Committee. There are representatives from 35 communities, uh, and um, they surround uh, Logan, as well as uh, Hanscom, and also the Worcester Airport, which is owned by Massport. And that debate over, well, is it a zero-sum game? Like, if, if Hanscom is kept in a box, is that going to make the situation at Logan worse? And we really don't think that's true. There's no additional space at Logan to build any more private jet hangars. Um, and Massport will say, oh, well, you know, Hanscom is the reliever airport when the traffic at, at Logan becomes more intense. Um, but we don't know if that's uh, verifiable uh, with any actual data. They might use that argument to accuse us of acting in a NIMBY way. Oh, we just don't like the noise, so don't build any more hangars. Um, but the fact is that, um, you know, Logan is essentially a, a commercial airport and, the, and, and is not uh, primarily for, for private jets. And so uh, the, any expansion plan that Massport has, it's, it's about Hanscom, um, not Logan. So that's what we know so far. Linda. So I just had a comment and then a request, I guess my request is, could you show the slide again that has each town's um, you know, plan to, uh, to reduce climate, yeah. Let's see, where is it? It was the graph. Yeah, that one. Oh, go back, the next one. That one, yes, thank you. I wanted to take a photo of that. And then just because I know you've got a lot of data here, which is really um, useful and important, there was one comment um, about, I guess, the short hop flights that they were saying that it would reduce those, and but yet they didn't provide any, a single example. Um, I know there are examples of that, and I think it would be important to understand that in, in your data set, um, only because in you know conversation with a friend who whose boss had one of those jets that mm -hmm. was hopping from I think Philadelphia right. to Hanscom, so they do exist. I don't know how many, and it just feels like it should be part of your data set to talk. I, about. I can say that I've watched the developer's presentation two times. And they have a consultant um, from a company uh, who was asked to um, estimate the number of ferry flights. Mm -hmm. And she was very, very careful to say that her estimate was only based on an algorithm that involved how far the flight was coming from, how long it stayed uh, at Hanscom, uh, and maybe one other factor. And she came up with an estimate of 3,000 flights, okay. or about 7% of the current. That was another figure that she put out. But when she compared the situation with no build of the project to build the project, 
the best conclusion she could make is that the project had the potential to reduce the number of ferry flights. It's no longer a solid assertion. Gotcha. They're simply saying it has potential. And, even, and, and in the same presentation, they said that they expected the new hangars to generate at least 12 operations per day. And if you do the math there, that's 4,300 flights coming out of the new hangars. So with no data whatsoever about who's actually on the planes, because that's a secret, uh, they are uh, throwing out a very weak estimate of the impact. Yeah, so just to be clear, when, when they started talking about these things called ferry flights, they said anything that was, came from within 350 miles and spent less than a couple hours at Massport, we're going to call that a ferry flight, okay? And they got these numbers from that. But that has nothing to do with the kind of flights that would be affected by building hangars. There's all kinds of planes, timeshares and all kinds of other things that the business model, air taxis that fly around and pick people up and take off. And so there's no correlation between anything that they've published so far and giving an example of a actual flight originating from an airport that would have preferred to have been based at Hanscom. Not a single example. And they have access to all that data. And by the way, that data is, a lot of that data is public and people in the public have access to that data as well and can look for those flights. And nobody can find any. <clears throat> I mean, there are, whether there's a couple of them that's possible, but it's, it's certainly not in any significant number at all since they haven't been able to identify an airport. You couldn't say, for example, that there's an airplane in Philadelphia that's based in Philadelphia, but it flies up here to pick people up to take them somewhere. That's a crazy number. I mean, if you were doing that, you wouldn't base it in Philadelphia. You'd base it at, you know, Lawrence, or you'd base it at Nashua. It, it, you wouldn't base it in Philadelphia. Uh, but, and so there's a lot of these flights that bounce around due to air taxi service and everything, and none of those, the whole business model is prefaced on, it's like an Uber. They're driving around all the time and moving around. And there's no evidence that any of those would be affected by uh, putting hangers at Hanscom. Just um, one observation here while this graph is up. Um, the U.S. government has a measure called the social cost of carbon, which measures the damages from the release of a ton of carbon. And if you look at that middle line of Hanscom 5% growth, by 2050, um, releasing about 2,500 tons of carbon, or 2.5 million tons of carbon per year, is gonna yield damages at the current social cost of carbon of about $500 million per year. Well, there's a big debate about what the social cost of carbon is. When the Republicans are in, it's $3, and when the Democrats are in, it's 150. Oh, right, but <laughs> in, in general, most, People, most economists who look at this agree yeah. that it should be a nope. large number and the number that the Biden administration has now adopted is $185 a ton. I agree. And that gives you a really big number and I don't know whether that'll be considered by the uh, Healy administration, but that's... Good point. That's a big number. Absolutely. Jeff. Super Bowl weekend. <laughs> Here's a factoid. 882 private planes flew in for the Super Bowl. Though, no, no, they were for business meetings. They were important to our economy. I forgot that part. <laughs> I feel like we have time for a few more questions. We're, I, I, I can't recall earlier if you said, the, does the legislature have any power over uh, Massport, and where is Mike Barrett and the greater legislature in, in, in this mix? Yeah, so the legislature created Massport, but they created it as like a walking zombie that they couldn't touch after they created it. It's a special creation called a quasi-public agency, and so they can't actually, uh, by its charter, they can't like do things about it right now. The only thing they could do is reopen its enabling act and change its enabling act. And that's like a constitutional convention. You know, it's a big mess. You don't know what's gonna happen if you do that. So everybody's afraid to do that. So they really can't touch it in that way. But they, they can work on the governor, obviously, and uh, try and pass these other laws that have an impact. 
and, and bring Massport uh, to be guided more by the environmental concerns. And that's where Mike Barrett is. He's been a big, he's, he was the primary architect of the 2021 legislation. He's been a leader in the state Senate for many years about environment. So he's totally on board and understands all these issues. Um, I think you said that uh, he would be amenable to addressing some changes if we were to encourage it? No, I think he, I, I've talked to him about it and he said, you know, we need to add some clarification. But of course, getting that 2021 thing passed was an incredibly hard piece of work that took him years. And so, and he had to, you know, twist a lot of arms and so on to get it. So to put in another amendment on that, it's going to be a while before they can get up the power to do that. And I'm sure a lot of other people have pieces they want to add to it. So it's, it, these things take time. Oh, many times. He's totally aware of it and, and thinks it's crazy. What is the immediate time frame? You know, I know, but the deadline. Oh, pardon me. I'm just wondering what the immediate time frame looks like. I mean, I know we have that report due March 15th, but like after, what's the next couple of years? So what, what the thing is, unfortunately, the report that we're talking about does not require approval by anybody. It's not a permitting process. It's just a disclosure process. So it really doesn't have any teeth, but it, the, uh, the secretary can require them to do more work on it. Keep doing more work. You haven't done enough work. And she, so she has the potential to drag this process out a little bit. But the reality is, at this point, they, you know, the, the sec secretary may be pressured to uh, approve the report, which isn't, remember, it's an environmental report. You might think it's written by an independent party. That's not true. It's written by people hired by the proponents to ram this thing through. That's who's writing it, not the state, okay? It's by the proponents, and then the state has to agree that they didn't lie in their report. And then, they, then they'll release to the next point. And if that occurs, they, I presume that they're thinking they're going to build within a year from now. They had hoped it would be already under construction by almost by now, because they, they had a much more accelerated timeline originally planned. So it's, it's definitely slowed down from where they want it to be. One or two more questions, maybe. Hi. Have you all thought about having sort of a workshop to have us get together and um, write these comments um, to, about MEPA so that if, if we're thinking about something, we could turn to an expert and say, is this right? I love that idea. It's like a, a postcard party. I can't think of anybody better to organize something like that. I agree. I agree. <laughs> One other thing I will invite you to do, um, I, I'm announcing it here first, uh, but um, there, there's folks in the room who've already participated in, in this. Um, <clears throat> it turns out that the land immediately in front of the airport entrance at the intersection of Hanscom Drive, which connects to Route 2A and goes down and into the airport, goes past the Air Force Base and straight ahead into the airport. The last crossroads there is Old Bedford Road. And it turns out that the land immediately adjacent to the airport entrance is not owned by Massport. And we found that out a couple weeks ago when we went uh, with a whole bunch of signs and banners to greet people who were going into the airport on a Friday morning. And Massport came out and asked us to leave because we didn't have a permit to demonstrate. We showed them the town map that indicates that that is not their land. And they had to turn around and go back into the airport without kicking us out. So, so in the spirit of March 15th, which is a Friday, when we think the report uh, will be uh, released, we'll be back down there Friday morning 
Uh, and we will let people know uh, on the website wh when that's starting up. Uh, and uh, we're going to be there uh, greeting people uh, coming into the airport to, to patronize these businesses because, as our graphs have shown, we have a demand problem. It's not just a supply problem. The problem is we have too many folks who are disregarding the cost of uh, their choices in travel, um, and uh, it's not sustainable. And we need to send that message to Massport as well as to the people that are supporting these businesses. So um, you can come. You won't be on Massport land. You don't need a permit. Um, and it's a really good way to send a message and also build community uh, with other people who really care about this issue. So thanks. Alex and Neil and Katie, thank you so much for your passion and your information. I will be there tomorrow uh, at 5.30. It's like 20 minutes from here, right? Uh, join me if you're interested. And there's some flyers and the website's great. I encourage you to check that out as well. Um, Annie, did you want to say one more thing? I just want to thank all the people that are here today, um, including well, Nate. Nate and Kit offered, talked about this at least nine months ago when they went off for their pregnancy leave. So here we are. Um, this, the day Nate got back, he said, let's do it. So I really um, appreciate what he's done. And I want to thank all the people in this room. You can put up your hands who have signs for what we did. You really spread the word in a, in a huge way for everybody that drove through Lincoln. Um, and it was really wonderful how many people at this church did that and spread emails. I know I pestered people like Andy, sending them all these emails that <laughs> and Joan, and they just uh, really spread the word. And there are people in this room that were involved in the first group, like Janet Boyton, who did videotapes to block the first UPS um, attempt here. So... I just think this church has has a really strong community. There are other churches um, around that have made a statement, such as Alex's church, um, churches in Bedford. Um, there's a synagogue. Katie, I don't. There are many churches now who have signed up to prevent this. So we might want to think about this as a community. Um, but it really, yep. Yeah. I have letters that they wrote so as a they church. They basically wrote letters. Yes. They have a letter, and the church voted on it, and they made a commitment to, um, to prevent this. So it may be something we want to consider as a community since every week in church we say to cherish the living earth. So I think Margaret Mead's statement about never doubt what a small group of committed thoughtful people can do to change the outcome. So keep going. Here are some tips from Katie. Go to the website. All these talks have been recorded. Um, so there's a lot of information there, and we hope that you'll join us and spread the word through the neighborhood. And Katie told me they got 500 new signs. So if you need newer signs and, you know, if you can make copies of this and and uh, send it around. Thank you so much for all you've done. Thank you.